Your minister, Andy, called me on Thursday morning to ask if I might be able to preach for him today. He didn't then go into great detail about his condition, but enough to know that it was serious. And I was happy to be able to say yes, and also happy to be here with you again this morning, even though regretting the circumstances that occasion it. Andy is getting the best of medical uh, care backed up with the healing prayers of all of us here and many, many others elsewhere. Look on Facebook. <laughs> Back to Thursday. Later in the day, it was confirmed. Then I had to quickly come up with a sermon title, and I had no idea what I would be preaching about. However, I did remember a story <clears throat> of an almost legendary preacher back in the early days of my ministry who became a friend more than three decades ago now. James Madison Barr III was his full name, a brilliant, colorful, and controversial Unitarian minister who packed the pews, preaching for some 20 or so years in our Memphis, Tennessee congregation known as the Church of the River on the banks of the Mississippi. On more than one occasion, Jim would wander off to places unknown and neglect to inform the staff of his intended sermon title for the weekly newsletter. And on those occasions, the announced sermon title would be The Great Mystery, <laughs> followed by the explanation, we don't know what Dr. Barr will be preaching about, but we know it will be great. So the great mystery was to be my title for today. Only somewhere along the way, as you may notice, the last word got changed. And it became the great surprise. <laughs> but the final twist is this, this actually turns out to be more accurate. Because the inspiration for this sermon came even to me as a great surprise. It began by a somewhat bizarre commercial email that appeared in my inbox on Friday morning, headlined, Make sure to give your BFF a hug on Sunday. It's National Friendship Day. Now, how many of you already know that, knew this? Friendship Day? I never heard of it. Um, and uh, having done that, having been dumbfounded, not knowing anything about it, I did what we do nowadays. I uh, Googled it immediately. <laughs> and sure enough, it's true. Well, it's more or less true. From what I read or actually skimmed, though its origins apparently go back to an unnamed Hallmark card employee <laughs> in Kansas City, Missouri, 70 or 80 years ago, Friendship Day is now more of an international holiday than an American one. I was a little surprised to read that it's especially popular in South Asian countries, including India. And worldwide, it's not always celebrated on August 2nd, as my headline said. Um, you must have done some research on this, too, because the UN, you didn't know this either, officially made July, or, uh, yeah, July 30th the day. That hasn't worked out for anybody, but, uh, <laughs> the, but since nobody's ever heard of it, it doesn't make any difference. Um, in fact, I read that in Oberlin, Ohio, it, they celebrate their very own Friendship Day every year on April 8th, though I can't tell you why, because you can only do so much online research in five minutes. Anyway, I got pointed in the right direction. Friendship is important to me, as I believe it is to all of us, when we pause to think about it, which perhaps we mostly don't. Like so many other necessary and precious but common things in life, we may take our friendship somewhat for granted. But especially now that I find myself in the stage of life where many long-time dear and dearer friends are permanently departing, I realize ever more acutely and sometimes painfully what precious gifts each of them has been. 
Yes, they live on in my memory and in my heart, but I still miss them. In one of his famous essays, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, friendship demands a religious treatment. Reverence is a great part of it. Certainly, it is worth thinking about. Whatever else it is, friendship is a gift, a gift to be valued and treasured, and to go back to my original title in a more serious way, friendship is also a great mystery. It is often looked upon as a diminutive of love, a lesser love, and it's clear that Friendship Day is never going to compete with Valentine's Day for popularity. Yet friendship is a form of love, and like all love, a mystery. Friends are people you make part of your life just because you feel like it, Frederick Buechner says. There are lots of other ways people get to be part of each other's lives, like being related to each other, living near each other, or sharing some special interest in common. But though all, of, all or any of these may be involved in friendship, they are secondary to it. Basically, he says, your friends are not your friends for any particular reason. They are your friends for no particular reason. The job you do, the family you have, the way you vote, the major achievements and blunders of your life, your religious convictions or lack of them are all somehow set off to one side when the two of you get together. If you are old friends, you know all those things about each other and a lot more besides. But they are beside the point. Even if you talk about them, they are beside the point. Stripped, humanly speaking, to the bare essentials, you yourselves are the point. The usual distinctions of older, younger, richer, poorer, smarter, dumber, male, female even, cease to matter. You meet with a clean slate every time and you meet on equal terms. Anything may come of it, or nothing may. That doesn't matter either. Only the meeting matters. And that is the mystery. I think it was what Emerson was getting at when he wrote, my friends have come to me unsought. The great God gave them to me. A, relation, a relationship for no apparent reason, is, mo is almost the definition of friendship. Only the meeting matters. Friendships have no reason for being other than the fact that it seems to be our nature to form them. Friendship is a relationship that has no purpose beyond itself, in which, as one John McMurray put it, we associate because it is natural for human beings to share their experience, to understand one another, to find joy and satisfaction in living together, in expressing and revealing themselves to one another. If one asks why people form friendships or love one another, the question is simply unanswerable. We can only say, because it is the natures of persons to do so. They can only be themselves in that way. Two people are friends because they love one another. That's all you can say about it. If the relationship had any other reason for it, we should say that one or the other of them was pretending friendship from an ulterior motive. This means, in effect, that friendship is a type of relationship into which people enter as persons with the whole of themselves. Now, it seems to me that this is both simple and complex. Friendship is the first border we cross out of the solitude of ourselves for no other reason than it seems to be our nature to do so. In the first chapter of the first book in the Bible, Genesis, at the end of each day of creation, God looks at what has been made and sees it and declares that it is good. The chapter concludes with the sentence, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. In the second chapter, the very first thing in the Bible declared not good is this. It is not good, God says, that a man should be alone, which may be interpreted to mean that humanity is made for relationship, for friendship. Many of our relationships are given, 
Some are socially defined. Most are utilitarian. We are born into a family structure. We get a license to marry and a birth certificate if we have a child. If we enter into as a business partnership or other cooperative endeavor, a contract is made. And we relate to people for instrumental reasons too. We have a relationship of a kind with mail carriers and grocery, cl grocery clerks, bank tellers, and others. Perhaps most of our relationships are purposeful in this sense, utilitarian. They serve some ulterior motive. They do not exist merely for their own sakes. The noted theologian Martin Buber calls these I-it relationships but we need people also on a level that is not, in the ordinary sense at least, purposeful. We need others with whom we can simply be ourselves, with whom we can simply be. And Buber refers to such relationships as I, thou. I think many of you, of you are familiar with that dichotomy, I, it, and I, thou. Friendship is composed of the elements of knowledge, and affection, knowledge and affection. My favorite definition of love is this. A friend is someone who knows us and still likes us. <laughs> knowledge and affection are balanced differently in different friendships, and friendships change. As knowledge increases, affection may lessen. Friendships are born and may also die but others only grow. A true friend can anger us, hurt us, disappoint us. In fact, we should expect this of our friends since we are more deeply involved in their lives. And the result is somehow only a deepening of the trust which must have been there from somehow from the beginning. The trust which a poet celebrates in this lovely little verse. Oh, the comfort the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person. Having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but pouring them all right out just as they are, chaff and grain together, certain that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keep what is worth keeping, and with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. But it is easy to slip into sentimentality about friendship. A true friendship will not always be easy. There's a kind of parable told of a man who surprised everyone by saying of an acquaintance of many years who had died that though they were close and had worked, toge they worked together and vacationed together, they were not really friends. What do you mean, they asked. You laughed and enjoyed so many good times together. But we never cried together, was his reply. A friendship is built not just on sunny emotions, but through shared hardship and sorrow, and even conflict and anger. In fact, Martin Marty, longtime professor in the Divinity School at the University of Chicago, has argued in one of his zillions of books that friendships are a more congenial setting for testing the limits of argument and difference than our more primary relationships. He writes, if two people share a deep bond of like-mindedness or affection, it will survive debate. He says that friendship represents lower risks than do other relations in which the partners are temporary adversaries. Lovers' quarrels might lead to sweet reunions, but first they will issue in torrents of words that neither partner ever forgets. They remain in memory and prospect to haunt love. Friendship, he goes on, allows for less intimacy and more freedom. A person does not have to make things work so convincingly among friends as with mate or child. This means that somewhere in life there is a space between life and death combat on the one hand and boredom or illusion on the other. A space where people can be true to themselves and their values even as they wrestle with one another and with competing values 
at middle distance. Here, as so often, friendship written off as a second best kind of relationship when compared to family, to love, to organizations of justice, reveals the function which it possesses, but which society overlooks. Might take a little while to get that to sink in, but I hope you get the idea. Marty seems to me to be suggesting that especially in areas of conflict with another, it may be easier to be fully ourselves in a friendly relation than in our more intimate and committed relationships. There is something that seems to me ironic and perhaps even tragic in this observation. Put in its best light, I would like to think that what it really means is that there is a level of honesty and trust possible in real and true friendship which is an ideal we can strive for in all our relationships. Few delights can equal the mere presence of one whom we trust utterly, says George MacDonald. To be in such a presence is to be with a friend. One of my favorite stories about friendship, which I'm sure I'm likely to have told before here, but you've forgotten it already. Um, involves that of uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, Thoreau who lived, Thoreau is the correct pronunciation by the way, um, who lived very close by each other in, uh, um, in Concord, Massachusetts. Thoreau came of an evening to Emerson's house. They sat by, side by side before the fire all evening long, reading, ruminating, neither of them saying a thing. When it was time to go, no other words having been exchanged, they thanked each other for a wonderful time <laughs> and Thoreau went home. In our noisy world, it is probably even more important to be able to share silence with a friend, though words, of course, will still be the most common form of exchange. Most friendships come and go easily, almost unconsciously, some last and deepen over a lifetime. One of the most important beauties of friendship is its freedom. It is because the relationship exists for no other reason but the mutual enrichment it gives that makes it friendship. There are no rules. Some people seem to have many friends, others few. I think we should count it a great blessing if in a lifetime we have known even just one true and deep friendship. But whatever the number, by every friend, we are blessed. Emerson's observation has become a cliche that the way to have a friend is to be one, but it is nonetheless true. Friendships grow in freedom. They are not required to be, they do not have to be, and yet they are. And friendship bestows freedom, the freedom to be ourselves, fully and wholly ourselves, comfortably with another. Without this essence of freedom, the relationship changes to something other than friendship. A good counselor or a therapist can sometimes provide a setting where we may comfortably be ourselves and explore ourselves more deeply, allowing growth and change. But the relationship is properly and necessarily bounded and protected. There is incomplete mutuality and no equality. There is freedom, but only with appropriately set limits, formality, and structure. The only real structures in friendship arise out of mutual need and convenience. Its freedom is absolute. And obviously, there is no requirement that we have friends, yet we do. And we have them out of a deep need, something deep within us, something very close, perhaps, to the essence of our humanity. Friendships are the least structured and most haphazard of human relationships. As is often said, you're stuck with your relatives, but you can choose your friends. It might be truer to say that life chooses our friends for us. I think Emerson meant that, what he said about our friends being a divine gift to us. A friend is a gift of grace, that is, something granted unbidden, undeserved, unearned, 
which serves no ulterior purpose. It is a complete, it is complete and whole. It is an end in itself. Our deep need of friendship for the other with whom we can be ourselves is born out of the mystery and paradox of our aloneness. We are alone, each of us, and we cannot make ourselves unalone. We are alone, inescapably, but we need others. We are alone but desire not to be. We need others even to become ourselves. And yet it is hard to be ourselves with others. Why is it so difficult to be what we really want to be? I don't know. But I do know that it is hard. And I know also that with a true friend it becomes more possible. And so a friend helps us along our way. A friend is that person with whom we can be who we are. Again, one who knows who we are and loves us anyway. Full knowledge and pure affection are the qualities of the ideal, the highest and deepest friendship. The Bible has surprisingly little to say on the subject of friendship, at least directly. But according to John's gospel, toward the end of his life, Jesus said this, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The command, the charge, in other words, is that we be friends to one another. Love one another as I have loved you, he said. Now, as far as I can tell, Jesus never intended or envisioned the church that has grown up in his name. But if he had this, but if he had, this might have been his definition of it. A community of friends expressing the highest and deepest dimension of friendship. People who could conceivably even lay down their lives for one another. I'm not sure how the Quakers came to call themselves friends, but it's not a bad name for a church or of an ideal for a church. I remember from long ago how pleased my good friend and colleague Barbara Merritt, now also retired, was when she was introduced to the town's grocery store clerk as the minister of the small Illinois congregation that she served then. And the clerk said, oh, that's the church where the people actually like each other. <laughs> true, true story, true story. Barbara took it as a great compliment, friendship. Such an ordinary little thing, but really it is not. Certainly, it would be no little thing for a church to become known as a place where friendships are nurtured, where people come to have friends by being friends and by working together in the words of that lovely hymn, number one in the hymn book that Kelly mentioned, this was not planned. <laughs> in the words of the last words of that hymn, working together to keep hate out and to hold love in. The church is forever building, T.S. Eliot once wrote, and I think so too. Whatever else you are building here, whatever kind of church you are in the process of becoming, I will hope that you will keep this ideal somewhere close at heart, so simple and yet so profound, to be a community where friendship abounds, where people come to have friends by being friends, to one another and to the wider community which we seek to serve. So may it be. Amen.